Namaste. Uh, to start with, I would like to take you all back to my story during the days of my engineering. Uh, this was the last days of my engineering, and I was a confused kid. I literally wanted to do everything and anything. You name it, and I was like, yeah, I want to learn it. So I was pretty confused about how, how to head on with my life. So this was a time when I started looking out to my surroundings, to my friends, what are they doing? And I happened to see most of them were actively either looking for jobs or uh, they were um, already had a job and they were earning. This sort of tempted me. And uh, I already had an uh, offer in my hand through campus selection. So um, after that, I thought, OK, fine, let me go with the flow. And I opted to uh, join the company, and I did work over there. So initial few days, I dearly enjoyed working over there, basically because I was earning, and I used to get the liberty to spend however I wanted it. Few months into the work, my instincts started telling me, there's something wrong, something wrong happening within and around me. Uh, this was a time when I started to question myself, what to do, what is it, why, why, I started to wonder, what and why. This was a time when I had to question myself, what is happening around me? So, um, basically, everyone has their own place in this tree of life. And we can choose what we have to be. We all have their own way of nurturing ourselves. We can either choose to be a tree or a branch or a twig. But I felt I was just a leaf extending from the twig of a branch of a larger branch, and I was seeking to uh, meet the trunk and roots of the tree. So, Rumi says, what you seek is seeking you. And I think the Youth for India Fellowship of SBI happened to me as a part of this unconscious seeking. That was then, my instincts led me to another flow. This was when I started to explore the roots of what I wanted to. I chose to work in B district of Maharashtra. Um, I started to travel to various villages over there. I started trying to understand the ground reality and also was trying to understand what the community needed. Personally, I come from the lineage of farmers. During my school days, all my summer uh, vacations, I used to spend with my uh, family in the village. So I had a basic idea of what agriculture is. But the prospects of what I started to look at now was completely different. I had slowly started to observe what's going on in the farm. I learned that there was a system that already existed, and it was slowly deteriorating. I started reading and understanding facts and details of the region. There were a few facts, as in, I was working in Maharashtra. So during 2015, Maharashtra had the highest number of suicides of 3,000 plus farmers in the region. And there were a lot of cases where the region was undergoing drought conditions. There were a lot of deaths of cattle, basically because of consumption of pesticides, chemical pesticides, and chemical fertilizers. I later happened to read the work of Schumacher, uh, which, uh, which is called as Buddhist Economics. So it talked about the deep ecology and diversity that our country had in our country in terms of farming. He proclaimed that, Production from local resources for local needs is the most rational way of economic life. I also happen to read a lot of uh, studies which states that natural farming is the key to sustainable development. Now a question raised in me. If it is just as practicing a small natural farming, taking the method of farming, and if you're able to attain sustainable, uh, feasible, and economical uh, agriculture, then why are the farmers not practicing natural farming? Why are they so hesitant? Why are they so resistant towards practicing natural farming? How do you work to set up a sustainable community? I had these questions in mind. I was searching answers for these. And accidentally, I happened to meet a lady in the village. Uh, she is probably in her 70s. But then she had a very good knowledge about how to handle nature. She had a very good knowledge about how the diversity has to be maintained. She had the ability to say when it would drain. She had the ability uh, to say which crop has to be planted in order to get rid of a certain weed. She also had the knowledge of how to save the seeds. 
So when I thought of all this, I realized that it was really required to develop a self-reliant agriculture and get back that system which is fading away. So what do we mean by self-reliant agriculture? It basically means when a village or a farmer has to farm use, without using any inputs from outside. All the, act, all the inputs that we use has to be in the farm. He has to make his own pesticides, he has to make his own fertilizers, he has to have its own equipments, the village has to have its own technology, and also the village has to learn to save its seeds as themselves. So having this basic idea in mind, I had my first challenge. The first challenge is to get the farmers to start trying natural farming. Only when they start initiated, it would start developing. So for this, I had to do a lot of meetings, like satsangs in the village. Uh, I also took them to various uh, farm for uh, farm visits, where we, they used, we used to show natural farming practices, which other farmers are practicing, showed them videos of successful farmers, basically to motivate them and to encourage them to start something new. And after this, there were a couple of farmers, a group of farmers who came up. They said they want to practice natural farming in 10% of their land holdings. And remaining, they would do natural or uh, conventional uh, farming, which they've been practicing from years. So we said, OK, then let's just start doing it in 10% of the land holdings. And we started working on increasing the fertility. As this uh, was happening, uh, and the time passed, and the, most of the farmers had planted green gram in their plants, in their uh, farms, in the entire village. The farmers who practiced natural farming also had planted green gram. The farmers who were doing chemical farming also had planted green gram. And unfortunately, we had a pest attack. And this was a common pest attack for the entire village. And the pest is called as apids. So now we had to get rid of this. We thought we, may, we made a meeting and, see, and said that we'll do a comparative analysis. We'll see how does it work with natural farming and how does it work with chemical farming. After a few days, we saw that there were ladybirds coming over to the plants. So what does ladybirds do? There are two types of pests. One is harmful pest and one is friendly pest. And ladybirds are friendly pests, apids are harmful pest. Apids are usually predators of the, uh, sorry, um, ladybirds are usually predators of the apids. So when this happened, after a few days, we started using natural uh, uh, pesticides. We did pesticides using uh, neem, cow dung, cow urine, etc. And we started applying it over the plants. And on the other side, the uh, uh, farmers who were practicing chemical farming did use chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides. After a few days, both the farmers ultimately, they were able to get rid of the pest attack. They were successful in getting rid of the pest attack. But what did the relationship that they held with the land, what did the relationship what the, what they held with the farms was completely different. The cost that was incurred in solving and getting rid of the same pest was different. The chemical farmer easily spent up to three to 4,000 rupees in order to get rid of the pest attack, and the natural farmer spent hardly nothing to get rid of the same pest attack. So the entire concept of farming is not about the methods to be followed. It's not about what is right, what is wrong. It is about understanding the uh, laws of nature, understanding the relationship that we have with nature, and how do we create new and healthy relationships with nature. So after this result, I was pretty excited. Now I thought, OK, fine, there is a proof in front of us. So when I say other farmers to join hands, they would be like, yeah, they would start and come, come over and say, yeah, we're going to destroy out natural farming. But in reality, the, it was entirely different. Even after showing them a proof that it actually successful, they were very hesitant. They were like, they didn't want to start something new. They didn't want to do natural farming. And I realized they're not wrong at their point. The entire livelihood for them depends on farming. And the question of what if something goes wrong is very general. What if the family has to suffer? That is the biggest fear. So the biggest challenge here was to get rid of the fear. We had to work in breaking the fear in uh, the fear of being financially unstable, such that they would start practicing natural farming. So I had to con completely reconsider the approach which I was taking forward. So the second challenge here was to develop an economic and viable structure. And this is a very 
tricky structure. It has to go in hand in hand in terms of marketing and production. It's something like a chicken and egg scenario. You can't have a market and not have production, and having a production and not a market is again a lot of, it can't happen. So first we had to analyze how the patterns and how we have to grow. So first thing we are analyzing was the marketing. Uh, so who decides the price of the product? That is the market. And how does the market decide the price? It is basically uh, seeing the availability and production ratio. Now, uh, in order to have a constant price, we have to see to it that all the, pro uh, all the production is happening properly so that we have a constant price for the particular product. The third challenge here was to reduce mass production and increase production in masses. So what do you mean by de reducing mass production and increasing produce production in masses? Instead of growing something in monocrop pattern, we had to multi-crop it. Instead of growing one crop, instead of all the farmers together growing one crop, uh, we had to grow diverse uh, types of crops with all, uh, with all the farmers. For this to happen, we had to redesign the farm completely. It was required to grow semi-forest, mimicking the nature. Uh, so when you say semi-forest, we had to layer the land, uh, layer the crops in such a way that we can use the land to its maximum availability. When you say layers, the particular land can have higher trees, they can have short trees, they can have shrubs, perennials, rooty plants, it can have ground covers, it can also have climbers. Uh, so the entire concept here is to harvest the entire sunlight that has been falling to the ground. We have to see to it that not a single ray of sunlight is going to touch the ground. Entire sunlight is being harvested by one or the other plant. This is how the forest works. Then this is how we have to mimic the forest in terms of practicing farming as well. Uh, so once this designing was done, um, there is a diversity of plants which is being there. And due to this diversity, the farmer would have the capability to overcome any sort of natural calamities. The next question here was to value add the products. So we, we designed the farm, we grow something, and marketing, we can't just sell it as it is. It's always better to value add it so that you're getting a larger income. For example, we grow millets. How do we value add them? We can either do millet cookies, we can do millet milks, we can do millet cheese, etc. So cost of one kg of millet is say for example 40 rupees. Then the cost of uh, um, millet can be converted to millet milk in a 1 is to 5 ratio. One uh, kg of millet, you can get 5 liters of millet milk. So for one kg of millet, you're earning 200 to 250 rupees by selling a millet milk rather than just selling millet for 40 rupees kg. We can also do millet cookies, which can be sold at say 130, 140 rupees a kg. So in this way, you're trying to value add the system and such that the farmers are able to get more income. Technically, the entire system is very dynamic. And to create a sustainable community, we need to work together and solve the issues one by one. And the, here the problem is not just about solving issues, we have to also concentrate on the uh, sentiments and culture of the communities such that it has been taken care. Um, also, one of the major things which we had to consider here is not just development. Development can happen, but up, along with development, we need to have empathy and love in the community such that we can grow together in a more healthier way. Uh, to end with, I would, uh, as we all, as individuals, need to start looking within as how our actions and lifestyle are being a part of this problem. We have to re-acknowledge our interconnections, reconnect with ecology, and try to find craft alternatives very consciously. Thank you.